looking at are two photographs that show the importance of propaganda to the Nazi regime. In the first one, we're looking at Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels, who was the Nazi party's propaganda leader, but also became the uh, Nazi state's minister of public enlightenment and propaganda. And what we're sh seeing in the photograph is them in front of the radio listening to the results of the 1935 uh, plebiscite in the Saar region of Germany. Now the event is, is, is not what's important here, it's the power of the radio that both the, the uh, Hitler and Goebbels understood. Now, this is something that we see, you know, uh, growing in the 1930s. Now, in, when the Nazis came to power, Germany had a relatively low number of, of uh, registered owners of radio. Radios were expensive. It was, you had to pay a fee to the post office to, uh, to own a radio and listen to broadcasts, etc. And in the Weimar period, political broadcasting was kind of not the thing. It was more for entertainment, etc. But the Nazis understood the power of radio to reach huge numbers of people. And what Goebbels did, for instance, after soon after becoming a minister of uh, public enlightenment and propaganda was to work with German manufacturers to create inexpensive radios for the German public. Now this was a huge success so that you know many people about half I think about half the radios sold in 1933 were these so-called people's receivers. That is, they were, you know, relatively inexpensive, they had relatively limited range, but they allowed people to get broadcasts. And of course, the Nazis were also expanding the number of broadcasting stations so that more and more of Germany could get regular uh, broadcasting. And Hitler, too, understood the power of radio. But he also learned in some ways the hard way. He. Um, in, and uh, shortly after becoming chancellor, he went into the studio to give a speech. And he did that, and it was a, it was a disaster. Because one of the things that, that Hitler as a public speaker was used to having an audience. And he had, you know, he changed volume with emotion. There was a lot of, you know, hand gestures, et cetera, in his, in his uh, public oratory. But in the studio, that didn't convey. And the technicians had a hard time trying to adjust the knobs to, you know, for the surges and volume, et cetera. So he only made one broadcast in the studio that year, but he did 50 radio broadcasts that year. And most of them were for, uh, in front of a live audience, which was also was a way in which, you know, the, uh, you, know you would hear the cheers and the, and the shouts and the enthusiasm of the audience, you know, when he spoke. And so he loved that. He craved that, that feedback from the audience. But radio, he, so he understood the power of radio and how it would work for him. And this was something that politicians were starting to learn. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president of the United States, also developed his kind of relationship with this new media. But it also, on the part of the listener, the average German can say, hey, that, that government did something good for me. That I never had access to radio before and they made it possible, so I feel indebted to them. And so you had this, this kind of way in which the Nazis used this, this, way, not o this tool, not only to disseminate their messages, but to build public support. And of course, radio becomes an important tool, not only you know, domestically, but the Nazis see this as a way of reaching out to audiences around the world.